Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. Since it was Friday and I just dropped off my Volvo to be serviced, I decided to have the service guy take me home instead of back to the office. He would drop it back to me on his way home. It was a warm late spring afternoon, and there was some yard work waiting at home that made my decision for me. We have a large backyard and I was on the back property line raking leaves when I saw my brother's red Corvette pull into our driveway. Great, I thought. The only time he comes here is to borrow something that he seldom brings back. As I got near the driveway, I heard my son Sam call out, Hey Dad, what brings you to the land of chickens? Dad? Why did my son call my brother Dad? And why is this the land of the chickens? My brother responded, I'm bringing back Uncle Joe's circular saw. I accidentally cut the electrical cord. He needs to get it fixed so I can finish my project at home. Is Clueless Joe around? Clueless Joe? My name is Joe and I hardly think of myself as clueless. Maybe I am? Maybe I should just stay on the outside of the garage and listen to this offensive conversation? Of course, I turned on my cell phone to record the conversation. Sam spouted, clueless car isn't here. He rarely comes home before five and I try not to spend much time with him anyway. So, no I don't think he's home. Say, now that school is out, when am I going to be able to spend some time at your place? It's a lot more fun than being around here. I'd love to have you come and stay but your mom wants to spend as much time as possible with you. You're her only child and as you leave, she'll be lonely. Give her some slack about this. She's supposed to spend some time with me Thursday afternoon, so I can ask her about you staying a week or two with me this summer. It was chilling to hear my son ask, why doesn't mom divorce Clueless and move in with you? I didn't know she regularly spent afternoons at his house. Oh no. Things started to come together that I didn't like at all. Maybe I am clueless? My thoughts of what was happening were crushing on me. Eric bragged, ever since I got her pregnant with you. I've asked her that monthly. She says, no, you are a great sex but you'd be a lousy husband. I have a husband that I really love and cherish. Every moment with him makes me feel like I'm the luckiest woman in the world. Granted my orgasms with you are earth-shaking but he makes me feel loved. I love him and I certainly don't love you. That my son, is why she won't divorce Joe Tyndall, but will screw Eric Tyndall every once in a while. I've gotta go now, but I'll see you at your grandparents tomorrow at noon for the annual family birthday party and Memorial Day lunch. At this point, my legs turned to spaghetti as I slid down the side of my garage wall into my hosta garden. My world was shattered. My son not being my biological son was gut-wrenching. My wife getting pregnant by my brother then screwing him with regularity was overwhelming. Somehow, I stumbled back to where I was working and sat on the rope swing. A swing where I spent many hours pushing my son to his delight. I sat on this swing and cried until I had a huge mud puddle at my feet. What was I to do? Before I did anything, I needed to assess my entire situation. Then I thought of my redemption. The DNA test. Several years ago, Carol... Me and Sam all took the 23andMe DNA test. How could that be incorrect? But what if Carol threw away my test and put Eric's saliva in a test tube with my name? That would hide the real parentage of Sam. What a despicable thing to do. They threw away my legacy and replaced it with that a-holes. Purposefully denying my right to know I wasn't the father of a boy that I so desperately loved. When that thought of redemption was disregarded, I needed to take stock of my present world. My name is Joe Tyndall, and I'm 43 years old. I don't weigh much more now than I did in college, 175 pounds. I'm slender, and wasn't a jock in high school or college. My specialty was running and I excelled on our high school track team. Now the distance running I used to enjoy is interrupted by family and work obligations. But I still get a few miles each week, sometimes running in a 5K or 10K event for charity. Employment for me is the dual role of Chief Finance Office and Chief Operating Officer at Tyndall's Machine Company in my hometown. My great-grandfather started as a blacksmith sharpening plowshares and putting iron rings on wooden wagon wheels. Grandfather Tyndall and my father Edward followed suit, with each of them adding the newest metal working machinery of their times to the business. Now we do precision parts for the aerospace and metal replacement parts industry. My father Edward is president and brother Eric is the chief marketing officer over the 50-person business. Dad didn't go to college but attended the best trade school available at the time. I have bachelor's degrees in industrial engineering and accounting thus being CFO and COO. 
Younger brother Eric's physical structure was the exact opposite of me. He is 6 feet 3 inches tall, 5 inches taller than me and over 50 pounds heavier. He was the consummate jock. Large, loud, arrogant, and a real bully. He was a crowd favorite as a running back in high school football. A small college scholarship paid his way through school while I had to work and get school loans. The only reason he graduated from college was because instructors kept passing him to keep him eligible for football. Eric's degree in physical education was of no use to him or any other employer so he started working for Tyndall as a junior mechanic. Much of our work requires precision and this was not his suite. Instead, he used his name recognition to open doors to new and existing customers. He couldn't discuss the finer points of our business, but he had a great ability to bullshit his way to keep the customers happy. Don't get me wrong, he was good at his job and beneficial to the company. Just like every other multi-generational company, we had our disagreements. An example was when Eric wanted a commission on new sales. Not out of line for the industry, but he was already drawing a good salary, same as mine. I used that timing to request that I keep all the income from the patents I had recorded. Edward gave in easily to Eric, but I had to really fight him to get the money I had generated. My wife Carol's introduction to me was courtesy of her exceptional bum. She wore a loose pair of shorts and an event t-shirt in a 5K charity run for the high school library. I'd graduated from college and was working with dad. I'd seen my fair share of uncovered female gluteus maximus during and after college, but this one was special. The rear view of her included a narrow waist flaring out to two perfect-sized, muscular but cheeks. I hadn't even seen her face yet, but I thought I was in love, temporarily anyway. With my running times, I could have stepped in front of her but I preferred this starting position. When the starting gun went off, I followed her bobbing ponytail until she was far ahead of me enough to examine her hind parts. There were a-hole perverts that put themselves between me and her to enjoy the view. By the end of the first kilometer, I was her only admirer on the race course. I calculated that her front side was as good as the back as I noticed bystanders watching her shirt bounce up and down with every step. One of the runners in front of her dropped his water bottle, and she tried to step around it and started to stumble. I quickly moved up to grab her arm and stabilize her. She grinned and said, Thanks. I really didn't want to fall on this concrete street. I am Carol. Hello, Carol. I am Joe. Can I run with you? Just to rescue you from falling. She grinned at my request and said, Sure. That was the start of our relationship. Carol had her degree in secondary education and was working as an English teacher. A year after we met while running, we were married in Carol's home church. After two blissful married years, we decided to start our family. In spite of repeated lust-filled evenings and weekends, Carol didn't become pregnant. Diets were changed, intercourse in different positions were attempted, and a thermometer was constantly available to gauge the exact time for fertilization. Our whole lives were guided by getting my sperm to meet up with her ovum at the perfect time. Neither of us really wanted to be tested for fertility at this time. Maybe in a year or so, but not now. I was heartbroken as I wanted to have at least two kids, no matter what gender they were. Both of us relaxed and returned to having sex for the love of it and each other. Just a couple of months later, Carol missed her period, but didn't want to jinx it by telling anyone, including me. When she missed the second, I was ecstatic. I was brought up with the idea that family was one of the most important factors in a person's life. The Tyndall family had been in that community for over a hundred years. Photos of the generations at our parents' house displayed the pride we had in our family. Pregnancy was not without its trials as Carol was bedridden the final two months at doctor's orders. The delivery was complicated, and we almost lost both my wife and newborn son that day. The embryo that became Sam enjoyed the warmth and nourishment that Carol's womb provided. Sam became so large for her pelvis that he had to be born by cesarean. While in the surgical process, he noticed a situation that caused him to caution us to not try pregnancy again for fear of extreme consequences. He made a point to us that another pregnancy may be the death of both mother and child. Something neither one of us wanted so we acquiesced to his recommended surgery on her. Knowing this was it for us. Not having children made Sam special for us. Sam was a vigorous young boy, constantly active. He and I enjoyed rough housing on the floor, much to Carol's dismay. The hours of us throwing, kicking and shooting some sort of ball were countless. His grades were not exceptional, 
but slightly higher than the average boy of his age. It was after his 15th birthday that the relationship between us started to fray. I attributed it to the normal conflict between parent and child at that age. We used to talk for hours throwing the ball back and forth, but he said he was busy now. Too busy on his cell phone and Game Boy to talk to his dad. When he was pressed for some form of contact, he became surly and disrespectful. From what I gathered, it seems he thought being an accountant was less manly than other vocations. Part of that idea probably came as a result as he was now taller and more muscular than I. Over the years, Carol continued to be the perfect wife in every aspect. Between her knowledge, intelligence, and total dedication to her vocation, she was now principal of McKinley School, a school that was designed to give special attention to students that were having a difficulty in applying themselves to schoolwork and having interactional problems with others, example fighting. I did notice that this stress of supervising unruly students made for some conflicts at home. She'd make biting comments about something I did or didn't do as per her definition of the task. Her irritation with me rarely extended to bedtime. She was always sweet and loving when we slipped under the covers. There was no part of our sex life I would consider unacceptable or not frequent enough. So, I was dumbfounded when I heard my brother telling Sam that he was Sam's father and he had regularly screwed Carol for over 17 years. No way, I thought. But what did I really know for sure? Creating the biggest doubt for me was how Sam had the same body frame as both Eric and Edward. I'm the odd man out on genetic similarities. Something didn't feel right, either in my head or in my stomach as I contemplated the possibilities. That evening I watched Carol like a hawk after a mouse. There were absolutely no overt signs that she was having an affair. Dinner was lively and enjoyable. Sam left to go pick up some friends in his car and see a movie, or whatever they do until 11 p.m. With Sam out until 11 p.m., Carol and I started the kitchen cleaning. She asked me to start loading the dishwasher while she went to the bathroom. When I turned around, the only thing she had on was a lace apron. She acted like nothing was odd and told me to hurry up, get to work as I have plans for you tonight. We laughed and played as we touched each other until the kitchen was clean. Then it was up to bed where I was treated to some of the best sex I have ever had. I watched her close. She was enthusiastic and very responsive to my every touch. Her belly always heaves, and her neck flushes red just prior to her orgasm. Both those body parts were heralding the big O for her. Not a single clue of faking her burning desires. Post-orgasms, we cuddled and expressed our undying love for each other. The next morning, Saturday, we were to leave to have lunch at my parents' house in honor of Edward's 70th birthday. Carol didn't like to ride in my Volvo and Sam wanted to go by himself so he could leave early. We did what Carol wanted. We all went in her Lexus. As we walked in the front door, my mother, Sally, proceeded to hug us in order. Carol, Sam, then me. The same order for Edward. Next, I was looking for the interaction between Eric and Carol. Eric happily hugged Sam, then held his arms out for Carol's hug. A hug that was enthusiastic on Eric's part, but lifeless from Carol. In fact, I thought I saw a look of boredom and exasperation on her face as he rubbed against her. That was not the reaction I expected between lovers who had been screwing for 17 years. Me, I got a hand clasp and chest bump from Eric. He delighted in ramming his 46-inch chest against my 36-inch chest in a form of testosterone-level comparison. My thoughts were to probe the skirts of a possible affair and parent controversy. Not be nosy, but be more like the bumbling Inspector Klauso of Pink Panther fame. Maybe rattle some rocks and see if a snake comes out. During a lull in the conversations, I casted out the first fishing line. Eric, I have to go talk to our CPA Thursday afternoon. Will you be around the office to cover for me? I said that knowing he had no comprehension of accounting processes and would be no help to anyone who called me. No, Joe. I'll be out of the office also. Big project in the works. Carol blew a couple of bubbles in her iced tea with her nose. That means I'm getting close to finding something out. Well, big fella, is it something you will get all sweaty and worn out from? Nah, I've worked with this person many times and I've always come out on top. The look Carol gave him was hotter than any of our plasma cutters. I could see the color draining from her face. No one made a noise of any kind. No fork against plate. No clinking ice in their tea. 
Midnight at a graveyard was deafening compared to mom's dining room. Eyeballs were rotating between the five of them. That also was a clue that all of them knew about the infidelity. I thought I could hear the sweat oozing up through their skin. This is just what I wanted. Be clueless Joe to the five of them. But underneath the clumsiness, I was comprehending what was happening. Dad broke the ice by saying, Will you guys get your calendars to see who goes where? He continued, I'm glad you boys came today for my birthday. My grandfather bought this 160-acre tract while it was miles from town. He'd be proud that the land is still in the family and our family business is going strong under Eric and Joe. As a result of my confidence in you boys and my advanced age, I am going to retire from being president of Tyndall. Eric will be the new president. There will be a change in the salary structure as Joe's new salary will always be 75% of Eric's. I really want Joe to stay in the company and be rewarded for his good work. With Joe's income from patents, both of you boys will have about the same income. Carol squeezed my arm and gave me a warm smile. So, I will answer directly to Eric? The Eric, who doesn't know the difference between a CNC machine and a popcorn popper, is going to be running the company. This is a recipe for disaster of the worst kind. Listen, little brother. I've always been the take charge guy while you have been the head counter of small beans. It takes an alpha male rather than chicken like you to be the boss man. Get over it, Joe. Once again, I win. You lose. That's enough, boys. Eric, you won't be the boss man. I'm still the chairman of the board and outrank you. I own all the stock. You will run the business like I tell you to. This company has been in the family for over a hundred years, and I won't let it blow up on my watch. We are Tyndall's, and the important family legacy is in our hands, just like the men on the wall. So, cool your jets. Dad pointed for effect to pictures on the living room wall of three generations of Tyndall men. Speaking of which, Dad, which picture on the wall is your grandfather? My grandfather is on the left side of the pictures. My father is next to him, and I am on the far end. I'd have thought you'd know that. I was just confirming it as I have a question. Looking at the three pictures, it seems I bear no resemblance to any Tyndall, living or dead. Different body style, hair color, or facial expression. Eric and Sam look like a Tyndall, but not me. I don't understand that. My mother's shoulders shrunk. Her face turned gray at the same rate as Dad's became red. Once again silence broke out while eyeballs rotated between my parents and Eric. I found the best way to get people to open up is to drop a turd in their lap, then be quiet and let them gingerly remove it without getting too much shit on their hands. Joe, you might as well finally know the family secret. Your mother and I were planning on getting married, and your mother got drunk at her bachelorette party and got pregnant. She and I were also having sex, so she thought she was pregnant by me. She had no way of knowing. We were married before she even knew she was pregnant. We both were surprised but happy because I thought I was the father. You were a weak and undersized baby. We thought it was because of your mother's pregnancy problems. You were a sickly baby and we almost lost you when you had the mumps. It was touch and go for several weeks. Joe, you were about 10 years old before we figured that you weren't my biological son. Sally had hidden the fact that she had sex with someone else prior to our marriage. She said you looked very similar to this other guy. When DNA tests became readily available, we tested and confirmed you are not my biological son, but Eric was. Well, that answered some questions as to how I was treated versus Eric. This was not the bomb I was expecting. I was fishing around to find out about Sam's biological father and got this slapped in my face. This had turned upside down on me. Not much I could do about it now, but I now had more questions. Mom finally spoke and said, that doesn't mean we don't love you as much as Eric. We raised you as our son, and both of us still consider you as our son. That was nice to hear from her, but what does this have to do with what I heard Sam and Eric saying? Okay, Dad, that explains my body type. Why doesn't Sam have my body type instead of like you and Eric? There's another turd for them. Joe, you and Carol were trying so hard to have a baby it became stressful for Carol. She thought she was a failure to you and came to ask your mother for advice. She remembered that you had a severe case of mumps and were probably rendered sterile. Your mother and I came to the conclusion that for your marriage and the Tyndall legacy, we needed Eric to impregnate Carol. Carol objected at first, but realized how everyone in the family would benefit from there being a new Tyndall baby. That includes you, Joe, 
You wanted a family and Eric and Carol provided you with what you couldn't produce. We'd hoped that this wouldn't be discovered. But between DNA tests and genetic differences between Tyndall and non-Tyndall body shapes, it would inevitably come to the surface. My mind was swamped by a blizzard of emotions. Emotions that were swirling around like a tornado inside my head. No words, I couldn't comprehend this fateful discovery. Both my mother and wife surrounded me, lovingly and tenderly hugging me. Both had tears in their eyes knowing the pain and confusion I was experiencing. Mother was whispering, my son, my son, I'm so proud of you. Carol whispered, my husband, my husband, I love you so much. Dad said, our hope, Joe, was that you wouldn't take offense at this, but relish the love that your family has for you. Gee, Edward, oh, may I call you Edward now that I know you're not my father? Why would you think I wouldn't mind being humiliated by my entire family? Sam snarled, now you know how humiliated I've been. Having kids think you're my father instead of a real man like Eric. Jez. Everyone turned their eyes to the insolent Sam. While slapping him in the face, Carol shouted, Joe's been the best father in the world for you. He didn't spare a thing to make you happy. I've seen a thousand kids with a father worse than him, but none better than him. You should count your lucky stars that he raised you. Sarcastically, I said, Why'd you take so long to inform me of this generous concern for my feelings? Why not pull the scab off the wound right away instead of lying to me all these years? I'll bet you had some jolly laughs behind my back as I bragged about what a great son I had. Instead, you nicknamed me Clueless Joe. Once again, the center of the universe is silent. We couldn't tell you that, Joe. It'd be too hurtful for you, and we hoped no one would find out. Plus, we needed you at the plant. You are the brains and the ingenuity of the entire operation. We'd be lost if you got upset and left. Also, we couldn't afford to pay anyone as good as you. We had a headhunter give us a range of salaries for CFO and COO, and he said it was more than double what we paid you. This is too much for me to comprehend. You encourage my brother to breed my wife for a Tyndall baby, not mine. You keep me working at under peer rate just so your profits and dividends would be better. You made me think that I'd be running the show one day, but Tyndall blood is more important than competence. I can't believe what you've dumped on me today. Next thing I know, you'll be telling me that my precious wife is still screwing that a whole brother of mine. Here it comes, the big reveal. Will she or won't she tell me if she still screws Eric? Maybe she'll just lie like she's been doing the last 17 years. Once again, the room was bereft of noise. Eyes rotated between the co-conspirators, yet no one denied the mortal sin. A meek voice finally moaned, I'm sorry, Joe. I'm really sorry, but you have to understand the tension and stress I have at my job. I don't love him. I loathe him for what and who he is. However, I need him to keep me from going insane. With that, she crumpled to the floor. My left foot started to make a move toward her to comfort her, but the rest of my body said stop. She brought this on herself. Now she has to deal with the consequences. I'm sorry about this, son. But we? Son, you hypocrite. Calling me son after torpedoing my whole existence. Giving me the minimum of affection compared to Eric while we were kids. Encouraging my wife to cuck me, pushing Eric's scumsucker kid on his mind. All the while laughing at my complete ignorance of the absolute and total disrespect you had for me. I'm done with this den of snakes. While saying you were doing this for me, you were intentionally and literally screwing me over for your own personal reasons. None of those reasons were to my benefit. They were all heartbreaking to me. I'm like a newborn orphan, an abandoned baby with absolutely no one to come to my aid. A personal and heartfelt screw you to each and every one of you slimy scumsuckers. With that tirade shouted so loud that spit was coming out of my mouth, I turned to leave. Just as I got to the door, a big paw grabbed my arm. I'm sorry about this, Joe. Since it means so much to you, I'll quit screwing your wife. I've been doing her for so long she is all stretched out so. I'm giving her back to you. The sheer audacity of that consummate a-hole. Giving my overused wife back to me. Again, I turned to the door but this time Eric spun me around. The spinning motion was of surprising value to me as I had the chance to sucker punch him as I was turning. I aimed at his nose and swung with all my strength. Trouble was I missed. I didn't realize how much taller he was close up. Instead. 
my fist hit him directly in the throat. Even though my swing didn't come close to his nose, his dark brown eyes sure bugged out of their sockets. His normal sarcastic comments were reduced to ack, whack, and other guttural sounds. He fell to his knees, holding his throat, staring but not seeing anything. Here was my one last chance. I stepped back and swung my leg as hard as I could to the underside of his testicles. It produced my desired effect. A blood-curdling, undistinguishable scream pushed its way out of his collapsing throat. Carol and Sam rushed to him, but with different emotions. Sam was trying to comfort his mother's breeder. Sam turned to me and shouted, You scum sucker! Ha! Huh, the hypocrisy of it! One scum sucker calling another scum sucker a scum sucker. What a screwed up sewer you have here, Ed and Sally. A mess. Carol started kicking Eric in the back as hard as she could, screaming, You a hole! You deserve this and a thousand more. I left the mini riot, got in Carol's car, and proceeded to back it into the driver's side of Eric's precious Corvette. As I accelerated out of the yard, I clipped the passenger side of Edward's new F-150 pickup. As a result of my anguish and humiliation, it was all I could do to hold the car on the road. An abandoned gas station gave me the opportunity for a respite from my turmoil. First, I cried until I thought I'd dehydrate myself. Then the anger burst like a four of July firework. Beating the vinyl dashboard was the most I could manage in my state. Finally, exhaustion took over. My limbs were weak and my mind numb. The cell phone's buzzing sound from the floor was one of the many calls and texts that the slutster, formerly my wife Carol, attempted. With a deep sigh, I thought what could I do now? There was no way they could undo what they had done. Not only was I a cuck, but also a true scumsucker with my mother not being married to my biological father. Well, isn't this an absolute shitstorm that I'm in the middle of? Three days ago, I was king of the world. Now at IS, a world of shit. The only good thing I could think of was that I did have options. I could continue to be clueless Joe and I would get a raise in pay, but would have to report to Eric or Edward as my boss. Every day I would see Eric and Carol, causing the same pain in my gut that I had today. That was not going to happen as both of them had screwed up my life. No way to option one. Option two was to just quietly sneak out of town. Let everything just continue around the Tyndall family with one chair at the table being empty. That's an idea, but they wouldn't care. They didn't care about me when I was here. Why would they care when I wasn't there? Option two was not for me, but maybe I could blend option two with option three. Option three involved me participating in the family of snakes, but not to their benefit. Make them regret every cheating, lying, stealing, and humiliating thing they did to me. Yeah, I like door number three. The only thing holding me back now was I was 20 miles from my house, so I needed to move on. The Slutzer's damaged car was left in the yard, not the driveway. My computer and all my important paperwork were boxed and loaded to my Volvo. Clothes I would need for the next few months were put in my car. All other clothes and stuff I wanted to keep but didn't need right away were put in Sam's 2017 Acura. Sam's dog bullet wouldn't leave me alone as I effected my escape. He was making the noises like he wanted outside. He was always a pain in my bum, and I'll be glad to be rid of the poop scooping, feeding, and walking of a dog that never liked me. Bullet did provide me a real nice parting favor by taking a big greasy shit next to the house. While laughing, I scoped up the steaming excrement and took it into the master bedroom. On our marital bed was the bed cover that my mother and grandmother made for us. It was called the wedding ring quilt as it had different wedding ring prints on most of the squares. Other squares were made from clothes that Carol and I had worn as kids. Our names and date of the wedding were stitched into the squares. It was a memory box of cloth. The perfect spot for the steaming dog shit to have a place of honor in this house. The final ingredient was my wedding ring on top of the dog shit. No doubt Carol will recognize the symbolism. All the wall pictures of the slutster and Eric's son were stacked on her cherry wood dining room table. After putting a towel over the pictures to protect myself, I grabbed a hammer. I drove my biggest nail from my shop through the entire stack, sending flying glass in every direction. Now I was ready to move on. There was nothing nor nobody making me feel I needed to be here. My loaded Volvo drove me to an extended stay hotel on the other side of town. After unloading my car, I drove to the airport and put the Volvo in extended parking and rented a Hertz car. My plan was to never let the snakes find and harass me. 
The rental car took me to my new base of operations. An Uber driver drove me to retrieve Sam's car so I could put it in a storage unit. When I get resettled, I'll unload the car and sell it. After all, it was in my name as a result of Sam not being insurable after his speeding tickets. A dinner of pizza and beer delivered to my room kept me from being seen by anybody. I didn't want to go out as I had projects to complete. Projects that included moving personal funds so no one but me had control. Joint credit cards were paid off and closed. I left her the amount of her last two paychecks in the general account and took the rest. Sam's going to have to study harder as I pirated the entire college fund I had saved for him by my monthly withdrawals. He'll have to ask his real dad for that money. Ah, uh, getting sleep that night took a bit of mind adjustment. I kept looking back on the good events with my family and wanted them back. Reasoning showed me the point that the people I loved didn't give a shit about me. Why should I care about them? After that reset, I became less clueless Joe and more fearsome Joe. Tomorrow fearsome Joe will hit Tyndall Manufacturing. It would be Sunday and no one would be in the office. Oh, what a fun day I could have. Funny how that made me sleep better. My rental car and I parked a reasonable distance from the front door of Tyndall Manufacturing. I could have parked my spot, but then someone would think I was there. After turning off the security alarm, then rearming it, I went to my office. Since I was the CFO, I had access to all moneyed accounts. Tyndall had seven different accounts, so I moved all the money to the one main account, reserving enough for two paychecks for the staff. The line of credit at the bank was maxed out and added to the general account. I wired all the funds to our international account in the Caymans. It was still company money. I had no intention of being charged with any crime other than being a cuck. This Cayman account was established years ago as we used it as a clearinghouse as we bought and sold items to European companies. Now the fun part begins. I changed the login name and password to every account. No one will be able to access the accounts for some time. They won't even know where to start as none of the banks sent paper or email monthly statements. While chuckling, I revised the postal address to 101 Big Tree Street, 2. Montana, 59085. I sent closing emails for electricity, gas, water, telephone, and internet. Since the beginning of time, the Tyndall men had always saved every piece of business-related paper. Five years ago, I initiated a program where everything was on the cloud. The only paper we had was vehicle titles and warranties. All members of the finance department had access to these files. I was the only one authorized to add and delete files. Passwords and login were changed so no one could even peep at an account. Any of the CNC machines that were online had a new password and login. Eric's office was my next spot to pirate anything juicy out of his computer. It didn't take much time to find some video files. Files of him screwing staff members, wives of local people, and of course files of Carol. I put the videos on my thumb drive and left his computer undamaged. I wanted to save this retribution for later. The last stop was the utility room, not an ordinary room but a fortress. The main line for our electricity entered this concrete walled secure room. Tyndall Manufacturing consumed a huge amount of electricity when all the machines are humming. Touching the wrong wire at the wrong time would reduce a person to ashes in a nanosecond. The electrician and I were the only authorized people to enter. The electric company bureaucracy would take a few days to shut down our service. In the meantime, I'd shut everything down from the secure room then added new locks. By the time they figure that it was the main transformer box shutting off the switches, the power company will turn out the lights. It will take a lot of work to open that extra heavy door. The keys to this room as well as all the other keys for rooms, cabinets, stock rooms, trucks, offices and machines were all thrown into a bucket of cleaner fluid that would clean off any identity where the key belonged. It was sad to walk out of a building that I grew up in and wanted to make it my one and only workplace. Being considered the president with Sam, coming behind me to run the place was one of my dreams. Those dreams were turned into nightmares, just like most of my other dreams. During my tenure at Tyndall, I had attended most of the industry conventions. I went to meetings and breakout groups. Eric took buddies drinking and to strip clubs. This is now my new hunting ground for employment. There was no need to open any of the voluminous texts or phone calls or emails sent by my formerly wonderful family. The words were just repetitive. We love you. We're sorry you were upset, but we did what we did for you, not against you. 
Not to hurt your feelings. Please sit down with us, or just your wife, so we can explain everything better. My mother pleaded that Edward forgave her for getting pregnant with me, and they stayed married. Why couldn't I do the same with Carol and Sam? The number 17 blasted its way into my brain. Because Carol was screwing him for 17 years. Your smother was just a slutty one-night stand. Tuesday morning, I called my attorney, Bob Carson, to represent me and discuss my options. He had an opening at 3 p.m., so I went back to my apartment and gathered up the documents I thought he would need. My preferred attack would be to file for divorce for adultery, but I'd have to move that witch to another state for that. I doubted she would go along with it. I did share the consequences of her infidelity with him and told him I don't want to pay child support. I'm okay with a 50-50 to 50 split of everything. I don't own any stock in Tyndall Manufacturing, so that was off the table. All I had was a salary and some income from patents. It was to my benefit that Tyndall Manufacturing was hosing me on a substandard salary. A salary I thought one day would lead to presidency and stock ownership. As a school principal, Carol's wages were very close to mine, so the attorney thought it should be opened and closed easily, unless she fought it. The plan was to do the paperwork and have her filed as soon as possible, preferably at her school. After all, she humiliated me for years. It's time to share some shame. While at the attorney's office, I informed him of the rearrangement of Tyndall funds. Since I was CFO, the company gave me authorization to move money between banks. I didn't take a cent out of the accounts. The money still belonged to Tyndall Manufacturing. They'll just have to do some work to get their hands on it. He thought my actions were ill-advised. Joe, if this rearrangement as you call it, results in any monetary loss to Tyndall, then they can have a cause of action against you. They could sue you and possibly win. And get what? What assets do I have for them to spend huge sums of money for revenge? Besides, they wouldn't like me being in court, under oath, informing the good citizens of our city why I did what I did. No, sir, they don't want that Pandora's box open for all to see. He shook his head and informed me of the $3,000 retainer check he needed. From my list of manufacturers I had met and would consider working for it didn't take very long before I had three meetings. These companies wanted both my services and access to my patents. There was absolutely no reason to stay in town. I had many friends I could count on to help me, but I hated to burden them. There was only one way to get myself out of this vat of shit. Fight my way to the top and jump out to some new place. Start over at 43 years old. A week later, Bob Carson called and told me he had just returned from the county attorney's office. Edward was screaming and wanted me to be arrested for embezzlement, wire fraud, and grand theft. Bob told the county attorney and Edward all the funds were in a Tyndall account that has been active for years. All the money still belongs to the company. Nothing has been withdrawn. Edward just has to make arrangements to have a new signer on the account. Of course, I knew that would require the old a-hole to fly down to the Caymans. Something he absolutely hates to do fly, especially over water. A month after Carol was served with divorce papers, my attorney called and asked if I had returned her phone calls. I laughed at such a silly question. Of course, I didn't return her call, text, email, snail mail, or smoke signal. There were two legal issues that were standing in the way of completing the divorce. Carol was objecting to my taking Sam's college fund and car. Even my attorney thought it would be difficult to get that past the judge. My response was that I would let them have half of the funds. If that wasn't good enough, I would file in court for fraud as I was led to believe I was his father and paid all his expenses over the last 16 years. I would sue Carol, Eric, Sally, and Edward. I may not win the case, but the media would have a great time watching Tyndall Dirty Laundry float in social media. A week later, the attorney called and said Carol was willing to sign the papers as submitted, provided I spent one hour with her. Supposedly, she wanted to justify or maybe just explain the horrible things she did to me. Either way, I didn't care to see or talk to her ever again. However, the new clean slate I was creating required extinguishing any legal entanglement with her and anyone named Tyndall. Under the condition that only Carol and I were in attendance, I agreed. I also wanted to have a video of the complete meeting to make sure I wasn't trapped or drugged. Sounds silly, but after what I had cluelessly endured for the past 17 years, I was taking no chances. At 3 p.m. the next week, I backed my rental car onto my previous driveway. 
Seeing no other suspect cars that could contain people I didn't want to see, I approached the front door. She must have been watching for me as the door opened as if by magic. I must compliment her. No sexy dress to tempt me. No favorite dinner in the oven or my special drink were on the table. Two stacks of papers that would render our marriage legally destroyed were placed between us. Romantically, the marriage had already been destroyed. Just like taking a shit, the paperwork is the last thing to be completed. She offered a drink, but I sharply declined. Purposely, I didn't ask how she was because I didn't care anymore. Why should I? Instead, I said, okay, you got me here. You can start. For the next 15 minutes, I heard her recite the cheater's Bible, chapter and verse. Nothing new here. I tried to count the number of, I'm sorry, and can we work this out? But her rhetoric was boring to me. She even opened up the history book and quoted how Edward had forgiven my mother. With the sharp in large letters I wrote, one time is less than 17 years at 24 times a year equaling 408 screwings on her envelope. It wasn't that many times, Joe. Okay, show me the math how many times. With a small and trembling voice, she whispered, too many. There was no anger or rage in my face, just absence of emotion. Seeing my lack of interest, she came up with something for me. Do you want to ask me any questions? Staring directly into her eyes, I said, why? After a deep sigh, she began, you know I got coerced into giving you a child from Eric's sperm. Your dad. Oh, sorry. Edward really wanted that Tyndall bloodline to carry on. He was concerned that any floozy that Eric knocked up wouldn't be good enough to carry the family name. Even while trying to get pregnant with Sam, I still made love to you. Hoping you would be the one to get me pregnant. I really wanted to have your baby and be a family forever. But I screwed that up royally. The thought of smearing her with the same floozy name tag that Edward disliked was tempting. I'll just let her stew in her own juices for a while. I don't agree with your disgusting conclusion, Carol. I've heard it enough times to be repulsed by the premise of Eric's baby creating a bond in our family. So was continuing to screw Eric after becoming pregnant your idea of keeping us as a family. Was it so much fun to continue some secret humiliation of me? No, Joe, that had nothing to do with you. I. Bullshit, I shouted. It had everything in the world to do with me. I was your husband. You promised not to screw anyone else, let alone screw my brother. What's wrong with you that you thought sex with anybody else was okay? No harm if I didn't know about it. I'm sorry I said that wrong, Joe. I meant to say it was more about me than you. When I decided to get pregnant with Eric, I found out that he was never as good a lover as you. He was demanding. It was all about his meat and what it could do for him and not me. I couldn't wait for him to knock me up. I was happier to have that crude man stop pounding me than being pregnant. He was sweaty, smelled gross and made me feel terrible that I had to endure that. Once I became pregnant, I stopped seeing him. Now all my sex was focused on the man I loved because he loved me and wanted to please me, which you did. After being with him I cherished how you treated me, both in the bed and out of the bed. So you went back to him later because I was too good a lover. Ridiculous. This may sound terrible. Yeah, this whole Eric thing sounds terrible. Hurry up with telling this sad, sad story about how you had to screw the big bad man that didn't please you. Please, Joe. I've only got an hour for what's left of my life with you to tell the story. I still love you, but I know I've ruined my chance with you. I just want to convince you that what I did was completely unrelated to my relationship with you. You were wonderful to me, the best husband a woman could ever have. But I have a flaw. I have been very successful in my life, and it sometimes goes to my head. I begin to think I'm better, smarter, and more intelligent than my peers. I lose my compassion for others and act like an arrogant witch. And you know I do. I needed a man to be cruel to me, and Eric fit the bill. Joe, this flaw was manifested after your mother and father convinced me to get pregnant by Eric rather than you. You mean when you were bred like a farm animal? I interjected. I suppose it was somewhat like that, as there were no expressions of love. We undressed, had sex and I left. No post-sex cuddling, kissing on the lips wasn't permitted. I found that I enjoyed sex, not the loving tender sex we had. My world would consist of his large tool, slamming into me with unbridled passion as my hair was pulled back so I faced the ceiling. My husband, 
my school and my family did not exist. Only the fireworks inside my skull and raging heat in me. After we both came, I would shower, get dressed and walk out. Not even goodbye kisses. No timetable for the next sex session. I would contact him only when I needed rough, raw sex and only then. Sometimes it was twice a month. Sometimes there was a three-month gap. It didn't matter to Eric how often I came to his house. To sum it all, Joe, I went back to screwing Eric because it humiliates me and I need that to take me down from my high horse and not be so conceited. Rough sex was what I needed. Not because you were a poor lover, but I had a need I could not control. Besides, I was embarrassed to have you treat me like I wanted from Eric. You are a very tender, loving person, always treating me like your queen. I was using him instead of a therapist to modify my superiority complex. Looking back at it now, I made a big mistake and I'm sorry I hurt the best man I have met in my life. One day, when this is all behind us, I hope you will remember the moments we were happy together. That's a pretty far-fetched story. At least I know most of the facts, or do I? Quietly she said, yes, you know all the facts now. Do I really know? Let's find out what I don't know. When was the last time he screwed you? The last time I was with him was when I was kicking his kidneys after the terrible time at your parents' house. I presume he didn't use a condom? Head shook a no. Did you ever think that Eric's wonder dick could give you a STD? Another shrug was the only answer. Did we ever have sex on the same day as you screwed Eric? She grew pale at this question. I always douche there and then again at home. That didn't answer my question. How many times, Carol? Not many, Joe, but there were times you really wanted to make love to me, and I hated to turn you away. Those days I told you I'd rather suck you off, and you not go down on me. Now that you've danced around the question, let's get to the real truth. Did you ever give me sloppy seconds? I didn't keep track of that. I didn't want to do that to you, but there may have been a few times over the years that it happened that way. I've no way of giving you a number, but it probably happened. The lasagna I had for lunch at Mama Anna's Ristorante was now boiling like the lava of empty Vesuvius. The thought that I had sloppy seconds was too much for me to control. Just like Vesuvius, the hot lava came roaring out of my mouth, full projectile vomiting. Suddenly the table and Carol were soaked with my undigested previous meal. I stumbled to the door while leaving a trail of small chunks of meat and pasta. The sobs coming from Carol stung my ears. I guess she didn't like puke on her carpet and her dress. Too bad. My attorney had to reprint the documents as no one in the courthouse would touch them. Two weeks later the divorce was signed with me retaining half of the college fund and car proceeds. She gets the house until scumsucker Sam finishes high school. I'm sure he was pissed off. But since he no longer wanted me in his life, me and all my money exited too. Since I had not fathered the ungrateful scumsucker, I refused to pay child support. If required by the court I'd change the filing to adultery and sue all the Tyndalls for fraud. No one wanted that shame. I was already ashamed to be a Tyndall. During my self-imposed hibernation I was at a quandary about reviewing the video files I had downloaded from Eric's office. I was still not over knowing about Carol's adultery, let alone be composed enough to watch two people I hate sex. Each file had a name, and I had the chills as I saw the name Syndra on a relatively small file. Syndra was the name of the wife of one of my best friends, John Brown. John was two years ahead of me in high school, but we had little contact as he was a big jock and I was a nerd. But this nerd was selected to help the jock get through his required English class. He excelled in his science and math classes, but was stumped in English class. Over the semester we became friends until he left to go to a small college on a football scholarship. After his college graduation, he returned to our town to be near his aging parents. He approached me about employment and I was pleased to see the emphasis on the types of math and engineering that would work well in our shop. On my recommendation he was hired, and we resumed our friendship. A couple of years ago John and Sindra hit a very rough spot in their relationship. From what I gathered Sindra had been at girls night out, and had either been drugged or drank too much. Either way she had sex with some guy, she was ashamed and told John as soon as she got home, but by then the damage had been done. They had two small boys by this time, and it would have been disastrous to get divorced. The Cinder file was the smallest video, and started with her stumbling into a hotel room. It was apparent that a cell phone camera was on a dresser. 
She walked like a zombie and started to stare at the king-size bed. Eric entered the picture and undressed the stupefied Syndra. I thought there was no audio, but it was because there was no talking. I had been impressed by Syndra in a small bikini at the lake, but as she stood there naked, I was breathless. Now I'd seen why John didn't want to get rid of her. Eric pushed her down in a sitting position on the bed. No tenderness or loving for the couple, just plain getting to it. He banged the inert Syndra until he grunted. After having his fun, he grabbed a drink from the mini-fridge and lit a cigarette. Slowly she shuffled to the bathroom, composed herself, got dressed and left. Neither one had said a word during this sex show. John had always wanted to know what had happened, but now I have some evidence in case he wants to seek revenge. I had John come over to my apartment to discuss something very private. After a couple of beers, he asked about my top-secret discussion. Unbeknownst to me, John, I stumbled onto a video of your wife having sex with another guy. It appears to me she was either drugged, drunk, or both. I can either tell you who it was, show you the video, or both. Which way hurts you the least? It took some time for the big man to compose himself. Tears were building up in his eyes and his breaths were deep. I put my hand on his shoulder but didn't say anything. Who? was all he said. Brother Eric. But she dislikes him immensely. Thinks he is a real a-hole. Why would she screw Eric? Like I said, John. She looked spaced out. I'll show you the video to prove she was not the instigator of that tryst. After viewing the video, he now knew the unnamed guy that screwed her after girls' night out several years ago. She didn't know his name or even why they had sex. She was sobbing uncontrollably while telling the story to John. Trying to speak calmly, he asked, why would he screw an employee's wife like this? She said it was the only time, and he never contacted her again. My guess, John, is that he didn't know her last name. Just drugged the best-looking woman and screwed her. He didn't need her name, just her kitty. As he stood up, he said, thanks, Joe. Surprisingly, this is very helpful. I'm glad I forgave her then because she was so upset and sorry. Now I know the facts, but I don't know if I will share this with Syndra or not. I'll just have to play it by ear. Can I have this video, Joe? You sure can. I think it's the only copy. Would you be upset if suddenly your brother suffered some accidents in the next few months? Be my guest. It'll work in my favor, as I've already kicked his nuts once, so I'll be a suspect. Make sure I know the time, so I have my alibis in place. Thanks, Joe. You're like a brother to me. Yeah, and you're way better brother than I was assigned. We hugged and he said over his shoulder, keep in touch. I didn't spend much time reviewing the videos of Carol and Eric, just not worth the effort. It just screwed up my mind. The time came for me to just destroy all of the videos with Carol's name on them. I didn't want to see those two 304s ever again. As I was deleting the files, fate intervened and had me hit play instead of delete. It was more disgusting than I could have imagined. Carol was on her knees, facing the camera with a euphoric look on her face. Well, she didn't lie to me when she said her husband, family, friends and school escaped her mind as Eric would screw her. It was obvious she was enjoying the hell out of this. Of course, she barked like the witch she was. The woman of my dreams and love of my life debasing herself this way was devastating. This scene erased every good thought I ever had of her. John came over for a beer two weeks later to thank me for answering some awful questions that had been tormenting him for years. Also, to thank me for proving to him Syndra was sexually assaulted, not having an affair. He had an idea that he would use the remaining recordings to destroy cheating wives and assist husbands who had been devastated by Eric's indiscretions. I gladly surrendered the remaining disgusting videos to him. My casting of nets for a new employer was working well. One of Tyndall's main competitors contacted me and requested that I travel the 100 miles to their city for an interview. This was the first flash of happiness for me in some time. Of course, I made myself available at any time and at any date they wanted to meet. The Donan Corporation was headed by CEO and President Tim Donan. My meeting with Tim, don't call me Mr. Donan, went very well and I was offered a very nice employment package similar to my peers. There was one caveat. I had to meet with the head of the Reynolds Resources for a personality evaluation. Considering what I had endured the past few months, I worried about what they might find wrong in my head. The person I was supposed to meet the next morning at 10 was Mickey D. Reynolds, the owner. 
Reynolds Resources did more than personality evaluation. They also did all the HR duties, employee recruitment, corporate governance, and reporting for donut manufacturing. Tim said this took a big load off his mind as he was a consummate engineer, a guy enjoying projects more than paperwork. Their office was very modern and sophisticated, a change from Donan's basic manufacturing office. After giving the attractive receptionist my name, I was offered some coffee and a couch to sit on until Mickey D would see me. Once again, no Mr. Reynolds, it's Mickey D. To my surprise, Mickey D was actually Mickey D, a very attractive woman, probably in her early 30s. She didn't seem surprised that I was stumbling for words as we shook hands, a firm but feminine grip that I found very pleasing. We spent the next couple of hours discussing my traits, preferences, and philosophy of engineering. Our conversations were polite and very pleasant. Delicately, she went into the reason why I was leaving the legacy job I had at Tyndall. She knew that she wasn't allowed to ask any personal questions, but she let the door be open for me to inform her of anything I wanted. All I told her was I was passed over for president and was underpaid for the duties I performed. Oh gosh, Joe, it's 11.45 and I'll bet you want to go to lunch. I'll send my report to Tim and he'll be getting back to you with more details. Would it be outside of company rules for me to offer to take you to lunch? You know, kind of like giving the new employee a Chamber of Commerce tour. She gave me a sly smile and said, I'd love to do that. Off we went on the first of many lunches, lunches that turned into dinners and more over the next few months. I was slow to enter a relationship, but eager to spend time with her as I really liked being around her. From her reactions, she seems pleased with the pace and building of a friendship. During this time, Tyndall Manufacturing was having a struggle financially. Even though Tidal had the cash to pay all the bills, the money was just not available. Edward had to act quickly as vendors and suppliers needed to be paid. He had to use his emergency asset to keep the company afloat. The 160 acres of prime development close to town was worth millions. However, the thought of mortgaging this property rattled all the cold bones of the Tyndalls that had owned that ground for over a century. The mortgage funds kept the company going until Edward went to the Caymans to get control of the money. However, the reputational damage was heavy. Instead of allowing title to pay for material after 14 days, suppliers demanded cash in advance. This severely damaged their working capital and the mortgage was not paid off as the Cayman money made it back to the States. Gradually, the details of the explosion in my personal and business world came out to Mickey D. She was very understanding as her world suffered the explosion created by a UPS truck that ran over and killed her husband two years ago. He was the founder and brains behind Reynolds Resources. She worked with him and held the business together after he was gone. Meanwhile, John told me that somebody attacked Eric in a dark bar parking lot. After being the recipient of several strikes by a steel pipe, Eric was begging for mercy. Laying on the ground, he reached up with his right hand. The attacker grabbed Eric's middle finger and busted it all the way back until he heard bones breaking. After a shriek of pain, Eric passed out and missed the admonition of the attacker. That's for sticking your finger in my wife. My job at Donan created a great level of happiness in my life. I settled in and since I didn't have a non-compete clause at Tyndall, I started pirating the best customers they had. They knew I had left the company and were happy to receive my contact information. I wasn't the salesman that Eric was, but I knew what they needed and how to produce it better, faster, and cheaper than Tyndall. All Eric really knew about our products was that they needed to be paid for by somebody. Eric wasn't getting out much to call on customers. It seems he kept getting hurt one way or another, usually after he was leaving a bar. Six months later, and after the divorce was final, the relationship with Mickey D was wonderful. Besides being beautiful, loving, smart, and caring, she was fun to be with. After many dates and growing closer together, our evenings ended up being more physical. Not rough housing, but lots of touching, rubbing, and kissing. One evening, it was apparent to me that Mickey was acting like she would enjoy being in bed with me. After dancing closer than usual, she recognized the signs of my sexual interest in her. While her leg was rubbing between my legs, she looked up with those beautiful eyes and said, Shall we leave now? Absolutely. Then I kissed her with more passion than before. We couldn't keep our hands off each other on the way home. It was almost dangerous. But when endorphins are flowing, how could we stop? 
There was no button popping, shirt ripping contest as we slowly undressed each other in her bedroom. Both of us had our hands in unfamiliar places. Breathing and heart rates were ascending. And then? Did you bring protection? She whispered in my ear. No, I am sterile. That's why Carol had Eric's baby. What did the doctor tell you about being sterile? No doctor. My mother said I had the mumps as a kid and that's why I couldn't get Carol pregnant. No doctor? The mother who lied to you about who fathered you and encouraged your wife to screw your brother? If I was you, I wouldn't believe anything she said and get your own doctor's opinion. Now I'm ready for some great sex. By morning I had sex at least four times and believe she had quadrupled that number. After we had expended all of our sexual energy, the topic of my fertility came up. I promised to go to a fertility specialist and have my sperm tested. Of course, I'd have to wait a week until my body regenerated anything close to the sperm inventory I shot this weekend. After a humiliating turn in the jack-off booth at the doctor's office, I was told to come back in a week for the results. Since this topic was of interest to Mickey, I asked her to attend the next doctor's conference. The doctor didn't take very much time with us to say I was not infertile. My squadron of baby makers only totaled 25 million while the average is between 50 and 100 million swimmers. The mobility of my swimmers also met the average mark. He said that unless we were desperate to have a baby right away, he would recommend going about life with no worries about pregnancy. Maybe some vitamins and no excess drinking would give a small assist. The best way to get pregnant is to not try excessively hard to get pregnant was what he recommended. It's like a game of roulette with your ball, sperm, hitting your mate's red or black ball pocket, egg. Your diminished number of swimmers have just not met up with her egg. Your odds are slim, but not impossible. Mickey D went back on birth control while I sported a condom for a couple months. We thought it would be time to get a place together. Since it was nearing Christmas, we would wait until after the new year. But first, she wanted me to meet her parents. She had told them she was dating a great guy, that's what she said anyway, and they wanted him to come to the house. This may be the beginning of me having an actual family again. I was a little nervous as we drove up to a large but unpretentious house. Just as soon as the door opened, Mickey D stepped in front of me and grabbed the man in gray slacks and red Christmas sweater. She made a quarter turn to the right and said, Daddy, I want you to meet the man I love, Joe Tyndall. Joe, meet my father. There I interrupted her by saying, Mr. Donan, Ops Tim, I didn't know she was your daughter. Wow, I don't know what to say. Say, nice to see you Tim and come into the house. Why didn't you tell me Tim was your father? Don't you think that would be something I'd be interested in? Yes, Joe, and that's why we didn't want you to know that. I wanted to know if you were interested in me or my inheritance. Also didn't want you to take any flack from the employees about you having a relationship with the boss's daughter and only heir to the company. Like me, she had a younger brother, but he died when he was only 16 years old. So, what does my being asked to have a Christmas dinner with your mother and father mean for me? Is this personal, business, and does it affect our relationship? Joe, it means I love you and want you to get to know my family. Business is separate. Since you've told me you have no family, I'm asking you to have Christmas with my family. Okay, now I know about Mickey D. The D is Donan. I truly am clueless aren't I? She giggled saying, maybe you should have a D in your name for duh. At which time all four of us laughed. With the air being cleared out, we all had a wonderful afternoon and evening. I really enjoyed being with Tim and Mickey's mother Barbara. I may be clueless, but I got the impression that my request for Mickey's hand in marriage would be accepted by her parents. I'm pretty sure Mickey would say yes, but considering what's happened to me, I hate to take anything for granted. My instinct was correct as Mickey jumped off the couch and onto me when I went down on one knee with a blue velvet box in my hand. She removed her lips from my face long enough to pant, yes, 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 then returned to her sucking all of the oxygen out of my lungs. Not that I didn't enjoy her enthusiasm. Three months later we had a small wedding. No one on my side of the church but John and Sindra and some new friends I had made. After a honeymoon to the Caribbean, we came back to my apartment and started our life together. First order of business was for Mickey to go off her birth control pills. We figured it may take some time before my guys met up with her egg, so let the good times roll. We went to the county courthouse for name changes. Mickey D. Reynolds changed back to her maiden name of Mickey Donan. 
With society's more lenient attitude towards gender identity, marital status, and personal names, I changed my name to Joseph Timothy Donan. When we requested his permission, Tim was both honored and delighted that I took the name Donan. With tears in his eyes, he whispered, Thank you, son. My friend John found a file of Carol screwing Eric and had the desire to avenge both his and my cucking. John's son Tyler was the same age as the boys in Carol's school and played sports with them. Tyler provided John the text addresses of a number of junior and senior boys. Using a new address, John sent a copy of Carol and Eric screwing to each of these guys with the heading, Principal Screwing Class 101. A week later, Carol was walking down the hallway between classes when she heard someone sharply barking. She thought that odd. Turning toward the sound, there was a small group of senior boys smirking at her. At first, she thought she had a button undone on her blouse, or her skirt had ridden up her thigh. As she turned back, she was startled with bark, 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 coming from a different group of boys. Remembering that the school mascot was a bulldog, she imagined that there was some team building started for the game this Friday night. As soon as she stepped into the office, the barking stopped. For the next two hours, she didn't hear the barking repeated, but when she stepped out of the office, it started up again. From one end of the hall to the other, it was sounding like she had just walked into a dog kennel at feeding time. Occasionally, there was a howl, but mostly bark, 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 resonating wherever she went. None of the other staff members were experiencing this phenomenon. The next morning, as soon as she stepped onto the concrete parking lot, it sounded like the starting line of the Alaskan Iditarod dog sled race. All the mouths were now directed at her, just like she had a 50-speaker surround sound turned to full blast. She hustled into the building, looking forward at the concrete, not the dog impersonators. She breathed a sigh of relief as the door swung shut behind her. As she walked to her office, a single male voiced, Bark like a dog. Which? Bark like a dog. The deep voice sounded like Eric's. But what was he doing here? Why would he be saying that phrase? Like a ton of bricks tumbling onto her head, she realized what had happened. The boys had a copy of one of the videos of the doggy screwings that Eric had subjected her to. She jumped over the question of, How did the video get out? Straight through to, Oh shit, what am I going to do? My job? My career? My dignity? All would be torn to shreds. She quickly ran into her office and slammed the door. Were her staff members smirking at her? Did they know what happened? Who has seen the video? What do I do now? Halfway through the first school class hour, when the halls were empty, she dashed out of her office. Over her shoulder, she shouted that she felt sick and was going home. She sure didn't lie to them. She really did feel sick. But she didn't go home. She roared down the street to Tyndall MFG. Bursting into Eric's office, she snarled, Did you give out videos of us screwing? If you did, I'm going to kill you. Eric could see and feel the heat from her rage. Quickly, he stammered, Nope, I've got them all in here. I'm the only one who has them. As he patted his computer and brought up the file, You stupid. You've been hacked. They've gone viral and I'm ruined. Can this life get any worse? Sobbing and moaning, she crumpled to the floor. Not knowing what to do, Eric ran to his father's office, and they both raced back to the howling Carol. The two great minds decided to take her back to her house, shut the door, and go back to work. Five years later, Carol had to relinquish her principal position as she had lost the respect of staff, students, and school board. A job was created for her as she was an expert in her field. Her new role was in an unfinished basement office where she reviewed all the new state and national procedures and guidelines. She had very little face-to-face -face contact with other employees and none with students. With greasy, unwashed hair, dressed in flannel pajama bottoms with her fluffy slippers, she went to the building at 6 a.m., then left an hour before school let out. Her infamy forced her to live as a social leper, going out of town to purchase groceries. Sam seemed to be sent home quite often for fighting. It's difficult to keep from fighting when his classmates kept referring to his mother as Lassie the Wonder Dog. At first, a number of men took an interest in her and sent her dog biscuits with their phone number attached, hoping for a reply. Title MFG's financial position took a toilet like swirling dive after I left. Losing customers to Donan Manufacturing, increased CFO and COO expenses plus poor management by Eric, doomed the economic viability of the company. 
In order to pay off the mortgage and other debts, Edward had to sell off the family legacy 160-acre farm. The land would be developed into mid-priced housing, taking advantage of the beautiful rolling terrain. A business broker found a buyer for the company and Edward pulled the trigger that killed the family business. Edward and Sally rented a small apartment that took a good portion of their social security check. When Edward and Sally die, the only evidence of the Tyndall family in town would be on tombstones. Eric and Sam left town as they began new careers as used car salesmen and burger flipper. On July 1st, the company purchaser called for an all-employee meeting to meet the new president. Edward and Eric were invited not to attend. The new shop foreman, John Brown, called attention from the inquisitive crowd and shouted, Ladies and gentlemen, let me introduce you to our new president, Mr. Joe Donan. The staff was glad to hear that they were sold out to a competitor rather than a huge conglomerate that would sell off the equipment and fire everyone. The real surprise came when I came out from the office. Mumbling and staring, most people recognize me but not by this name. Hello everyone. I'm glad to be back in this building. Did you miss me? This was met with a huge roar. I guess Eric wasn't as good a president as he thought he was. After assuring the assembled Donan manufacturing employees of expected utilization and growth from the former Tyndall Manufacturing, the employees started chanting, Donan, Donan, Donan. Of course, the name on the building and your paycheck will be Donan Manufacturing. More cheers. Thank you for the wonderful reception. I'm sure this will be a great change for all of us. Now, let me introduce you to my family, my wife Mickey D, and our son Timothy Joseph Donan. Yes. The DNA confirmed he was my son. Dear listeners, please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.